We've come to condensation. Uh, for NCC 2019, we have some brand new provisions, and these are in both volume one and in volume two, concerning condensation. This is the first time a part of the NCC has directly addressed condensation in buildings. And condensation can lead to mould growth, and mould growth leads to unhealthy conditions for occupants, and so it is appropriate and in line with the current goals of the NCC to include something which controls condensation. And at the outset, I have to say three things. Firstly, firstly I need to say that these measures aren't a magic bullet. They're not going to necessarily cure condensation in your buildings. You can follow the NCC, yet they're not going to prevent condensation in all cases. You can still get condensation if you follow these provisions. That's number one. The second thing I need to say is that these provisions, like the rest of the NCC, are minimum standards. <coughs> Nothing stops you from going beyond the minimum standards set by the NCC. So if you are dealing with an area which is prone to condensation, then there's nothing stopping you, and it's probably a good idea to go beyond the minimum standards that I'll step through shortly. The third thing I need to say is that what you see in NCC 2019 is step one. So there is ongoing work going on in condensation. It's still on our work program. And so it's very likely you're going to sign, find some new provisions again in NCC 2022 covering condensation. Yet we do have stage one provisions, <clears throat> and here's what they cover. And I'll, they also come with some new performance requirements. Here they are for volume one and two. And immediately, as you look at these performance requirements, two things are apparent. The first is we're only talking about class one, class two, and class four parts of buildings. And even in the class two buildings, we're only talking about the sole lock units. So there are a very limited scope of these provisions. The, the dwellings where people live, class one, class two, solid units, and class four parts of buildings. The second thing to notice is, like I said earlier, these performance requirements themselves aren't looking for the eradication of condensation. Even the performance requirements indicate that, it's, you know, that we can't eradicate it. Um, it's not that easy. The performance requirements are looking to minimise the health impacts associated with condensation. There's two ways that the deemed to satisfy provisions do this, and that's through sarking and ventilation. Firstly, sarking. This is the same provision in both volumes, F6.2 in volume one and 3.8.72 in volume two. The first thing to note is you don't have to use sarking. These provisions aren't requiring that you use sarking. It might be that another part of the NCC requires you to use sarking, but you, these provisions aren't requiring it. If you do use sarking, that's great, then A here applies. And in those colder climate zones, not here in Brisbane, but in climate zones six, seven, and eight, that sarking needs to be vapor permeable and also has to be on the outside of the insulation layer. If you don't use sarking, that's fine, except B kicks in and you need to have a drained cavity unless you've got a single skin masonry wall or a single skin of concrete, tilt up concrete wall. So that's sarking. The second control is ventilation. The ventilation provision managed condensation by controlling where you discharge the air and also by giving a minimum rate of discharge, minimum flow rate. And like the sarking, these provisions aren't requiring that you have ventilation. It might be another provision requires that you have ventilation, but if you have ventilation, that's great. You have to hit the required flow rate, which is 25 litres per second for bathrooms and sanitary compartments. And it's, also, and it's 40 litres per second where you've got more humid environments in the kitchen and the laundry where the clothes dryer is parked. And you've, got the, you've also got to discharge to the new requirements. And in, in most cases, this will mean discharging to outdoor air or discharging to a ventilated roof space. And the new provisions also spell out what a ventilated roof space looks like. And you have to do this even if you have a window. And the, about discharge, note carefully that for volume one, so that's the class two Solok units and the class four part of a building, exhaust from the kitchen has to go outside. You can use your reticulating range hood inside a class one, but if you've got a volume one, class two or class four, your range hood has to go to outside. Here's another new part for volume one only occupiable outdoor areas. And uh, so 
the question on everyone's mind, what is an occupiable outdoor area? Well, I'm glad you asked because we've got a new defined term. <laughs> we've got a new defined term. It's a space on the roof or a balcony or a similar part of a building which meets these requirements. As you can see, it's outside. It's generally accessible, so it's not your plant, plant equipment up on the roof. And it's where you can't readily ex escape from it, so it's not in that open space or directly, directly associated with open space. So when you're thinking about occupiable outdoor areas, think about your rooftop bars, your rooftop car parks, parts of a building like that. So why have we got these new provisions? Well, it's for reasons like this. It's clarifying how parts of the NCC apply. Think of these two buildings, the one on the left, these are in, in section. On the left, we've got a three-storey building. And on the right is a two-storey building. Rising stories is two, except we've got an occupiable rooftop. So for the class five to nine building under the current NCC, the one on the left will need to have a fire-isolated exit stair because that stair would be serving three storeys. However, the building on the right, that same exit stair would be connecting only two storeys as defined by the NCC. So on the left, we've got a fire isolated exit. On the right, we don't. However, our occupant up there, made on the left and made on the right, they're in very similar predicaments, aren't they? So part G6, occupiable outdoor areas, comes along and changes that. G6.4 counts the occupiable outdoor area on the right as a story for determining when a fire isolated exit is required. It's not just about stories and exits. The new part G6 covers all these items that you see here. And there's a clarification about how an occupiable outdoor area is to be treated. And sometimes a concession is appropriate because it's outside. For instance, the fire hazard properties on that first top point there. Because we're outside, smoke's gonna get away. So we don't worry about applying the C1.10 requirements to do with smoke hazard management. However, we do wanna control the spread of fire on an occupiable outdoor area. So we do have um, C110 requirements related to spread of fire applying to, those, to these occupiable outdoor areas, the rooftop bars and the, and the like. Now it's important to note that these provisions don't apply to every single occupiable outdoor area as captured by that definition. Because when you think about it, if you go to a hotel and go onto the balcony, that's a place which is outside the building and you can't, it's not connected to open space. It meets all those parameters for the defined term. So what G6.1 does, the application provision in G6, it sets out parameters about when these provisions do apply. So your hotel balcony and other areas like that do get the fire hazard properties. You can't have a excessive spread of fire up there, but it doesn't, you don't have to worry about counting that for the purposes of a story if it's just, and the other things there. You don't have to get your hose reel out onto the hotel, or, or your um, hose reels aren't required in the twos. But um, yeah, you, the, the other parts don't apply. But, um, and, and also besides your hotel balconies, it's gonna be other minor balconies and minor outdoor, occupiable outdoor areas like a, a, small, a small balcony or a small deck coming off an office building, things like that. But your rooftop bars, the larger, more significant ones are captured by the provisions. Now we come to section J. And when you pick up section J for NCC 2019, you'll note that a lot has changed. There's new verification methods. Um, J2, glazing, has been removed entirely doesn't exist in NCC 2019, and that's because now there's a new whole of facade approach to measuring glazing and insulation. You have to take into account the entire wall and not count the wall and the glazing separately. So J2 has basically been squashed into J1. Um, you'll also find that the level of stringency has generally increased. There's a lot of change. You'll also notice a transition period, and I did touch on this earlier, but I'll describe that in a bit more detail now. I need to explain how this transition period works. So until 1st of May next year, you can use the current Section J 2016, or you're, you are welcome to use the Section J of NCC 2019. But the thing about this transition period until the 1st of May next year is you can't mix and match. The changes in NCC 2019 are so extensive that you can't mix and match between 2016 and 2019. You have to choose 
2016 or 2019, not a bit of one or a bit of the other. We've got this transition period, like this, for the same reason we have any transition period, is to give industry a chance to become familiar with the new requirements. And because there are very significant changes, there are uh, a, a one year period has been placed to allow industry to become familiar with these requirements. Here are some of the changes. Um, we've got a quantified performance requirement, JP1, now has kilojoules per square metre targets for condition spaces. I mentioned the stringency has gone, gone up. You're looking at about a 30 to 40 per cent, depends where the building is, but you'd be achieving a 30 to 40 per cent energy use decrease for a Section J 2019 building. Uh, reference building verification method JV3. The parameters have been firmed up in that one. There's new, there's extra detail about the, the modelled building and the, and the deemed to satisfy building, the two model buildings. Um, I mentioned J2's gone because it's been squashed into J1. And there's also HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, air conditioning has been given the holistic approach as well. In, so the J, J5 has been amended accordingly. And for the first time, the NCC controls the amount of energy that's used by lifts and escalators. Now, we're not going to cover all these changes today. If we did, we'd be here for another hour on top of the usual seminar. So instead, this seminar is concentrating on things you need to use, know this year for May on the basis that we've got opportunity to provide further education for things you need to know next May. But what we do have is um, we're working with the Property Council of Australia. They're going to be rolling, rolling out some seminars on Section J, Energy Efficiency for NCC 2019. So look out for those seminars uh, towards the middle of the year. You can see that on, we'll put, have details on our website. And we're also working on an updated edition of the handbook. The Section J handbook is being updated very extensively to reflect the new provisions. So keep an eye out for those on our website. There's also new calculators that are going up for, and not just, well, glazing calculators gone, obviously, because J2's gone, but we've got facade calculators, um, air conditioning calculators going up on our website as well. So keep a look out for those. That brings us through Volume 1, and we're now up to Volume 2. Now, we have covered a lot of Volume 2 changes already through um, our first run through Volume 1, because a lot of the changes in Volume 1 are also in Volume 2, like condensation. So we're going to go through and pick up the things we haven't covered yet. And one of the first things you'll notice when you pick up Volume 2 is that some parts have been moved around. For starters, we've expanded 3.10 and we've brought in heating appliances, and there's also a new, another new part in there, 3106, decks and balcony, balconies attachments. And we've also grouped all the structural requirements and put them into a new part, part 3.0. So, you know, there was 311 structure and a few other requirements. We've grouped those into part 3.0. And what we're doing is we're restructuring to make volume two what it always was meant to be, and that is the structure of volume two follows the construction sequence of a house. You know, you start with the structure, the footings, the slab, move through into your framing and then into your cladding, et cetera, et cetera. So some of these amendments are to make the, the structure follow the sequence of a house more closely. Part 3.5 and part 3.7, 3.5 being roof and wall cladding and part 3.7 being fire safety. These have been um, restructured as well because that ACP review project, Acceptable Construction Practice Review Project I mentioned earlier, has been very busy in these areas and has created a lot of new content and a lot of changes in there. And so part 3.5 and 3.7 have been restructured as well. Volume 2 receives nine new verification methods. And some of these we've already talked about for Volume 1, such as natural light um, and building ceiling. There, V2623, that's also in Volume 1. Um, that's as JV4, and this is where you use blower door testing to verify that a building's ceiling is appropriate. So if you're looking to do a, a performance solution in any of these areas, check out these verification methods. They may suit your project. So we move to part 3.1, and 
we get a new ex acceptable construction manual here in part 3.1. There's no acceptable construction practice. As you're aware, you've got your acceptable construction manual, which is where you can directly go to a standard, or your acceptable construction practice, which is where you find deemed to satisfy provisions setting that out. We've got a new acceptable construction manual without practice for earth retaining walls. And that brings up this reference standard AS4678, which hasn't been a directly reference standard until NCC 2019. There's some limitations about when you can use this earth retaining wall standard. Um, site conditions, so you can't use it in areas prone to landslips. Uh, cyclic loading, so you can't use it below plant and equipment. I, what you will find is that this standard can be used for many uh, retaining walls. Maximum height under this standard, 15 metres. So if you're going to use a, a retaining wall bigger than 15 metres, you're going to have to use a different standard. I, I haven't done one myself. Has anyone here done a 15.1 retaining wall? Probably not. Um, so that's a brand new acceptable construction manual for NCC 2019. Quite a few changes in masonry, part 3.3. Um, we still have the same acceptable construction manuals, AS 3700 and AS 4773. Um, previously, we didn't have acceptable construction practice in NCC 2016, whereas this year we do. So part 3.5 has been greatly expanded to bring in two new parts for masonry veneer, uh, one part for masonry veneer and another part for isolated masonry piers. So the masonry veneer provisions, you'll find uh, requirements there. So you don't have to go to the standard directly. You can go to the provisions in the NCC and you find you, what you need to know there about the masonry units, about the, the articulation joints, the materials in the articulation joints, you, the, the, the joints between the units, the accessories like the brick ties, also accessories for lintels. So we've got requirements in the NCC deemed to satisfy about lintels in masonry veneer walls. So new part where you can go straight to the DTS to build a masonry veneer wall. And we've also got a new part 336 for isolated masonry piers. And so these are of course the piers below the a suspended floor like uh, indicated here on the right. And those requirements will set out your masonry configurations for piers up to certain heights. And you get plenty of lovely diagrams like that one there. But it's also covering your piers, your masonry piers used for carports and patios and things like that. So deemed to satisfy provisions, uh, acceptable construction practice in NCC 2019 volume two for masonry. The acceptable construction manuals remain. However, we have referenced amendments to both those 4773 and also to 3700. And the NCC doesn't do this often, but sometimes it does. When it references a standard, the NCC will sometimes modify that standard as it's referenced. In certain circumstances, AS 3700 is modified, as you can see here. So you've got the first one, which removes a part of a provision. And you've got the second one there, which also makes, which makes you do some extra work, some extra calculation for particular unreinforced masonry provisions. So if you're picking up AS 3700, just make sure that you're using it in the proper way as stipulated by this part and others in, AS 30, in, in part 3.3 masonry. We move to part 3.4 framing. And one thing to note here in part 3.4 is that we've separated out what happens in the subfloor timbers. Previously, NCC 2016, we didn't actually make specific requirements about in-ground timbers. We only talked about subfloor timbers. We've separated that out. So you've got your subfloor timbers, which are above ground, and those are the same provisions taken across from last year, but also we've included now where you have subfloor timbers, which are in the ground. And of course, you've got the higher preservative treated timbers there, the H5 requirements for the in-ground timbers. Steel framing. Um, sorry, here we are. Steel framing. Now, steel framing, acceptable construction manual, acceptable construction practice. The acceptable construction practice for steel framing, which has been there for a little while, we found wasn't being used. And that's because the reference documents, the, um, the NASH standards, National Association of Steel Housing, and also the um, 4100 and 4600 
Australian standards or Australian New Zealand standard 4600 were more contemporary provisions. They were more useful provisions and so those were being used rather than the acceptable construction practice found in the NCC. For that reason, for 2019 we've taken out the acceptable construction practice and you need to go straight to the acceptable construction manual. So we've come to timber framing now and in timber framing we've got some additional acceptable construction manuals. So currently in 2016 you only see your 1684.2 uh, in there and also non -cycle, and also the simplified version 0.4 is listed there as well at the moment. We've expanded that list of acceptable construction manuals. So you've got your designer timber structures, your 17 and 25 for nail plated Roof, roof trusses. We've introduced direct reference to cyclonic areas and also particle board, particle board flooring. Now a lot of these were secondary references picked up in other ways. What we've the acceptable construction practice review project found that was appropriate to put the direct reference in here. I mentioned that roof and wall cladding has been overhauled by the acceptable construction practice review project. So there's been a lot of restructuring, there's some additional content uh, including content to do with what to do when you have a parapet, which hasn't been in the NCC yet. And we've improved existing content, especially content around flashing. We've also included an explanation of terms. When you go to framing, you've got your explanation of terms there for timber framing. Um, we've put that in also here for part 3.5. We've also updated the sheet roofing requirements. You're going to find, as you open it up and have a look, that we're putting in separate parts for, for different subject areas rather than just what we had previously which was separate clauses for areas. And this made it a more logical way of setting this part out. Uh, part 352 for roof tiles, there's more detail about flashings when the, when the roof tile wall comes up against a timber or masonry wall. And, and this has been important because flashings and flashings generally have been improved through this section because it's a big problem across Australia and I understand it to be quite a problem here in Queensland. The flashing hasn't been always operating and so we've, as it should, so we've been really expanding how the, the flashing provisions and clarifying the flashing provisions in the NCC. And we've been including lots of new figures such as this one. This is a brand new figure in NCC 2019 which sets out where you don't have to have a flashing above a window or other opening on account of the eave. So roof and wall cladding, this is a new provision which references wall cladding. Um, minimum clearance from the ground for your wall cladding and your minimum clearance or minimum height of it above the subfloor timbers. This is brand new, deemed to satisfy for NCC 2019. As you can see there, the, where you're above the ground in low rainfall or well drained areas, your cladding has to be at least 100 millimetres above that. If you pave or concrete, it only has to be 50 mil and you have to make sure your cladding is at least 50 mil below the suspended floor. The ACP review's also gone through part 3.7, fire safety. And as you can see here, like part 3.5, the fire safety provisions have been regrouped or recast into more logical uh, more logical structure and you get different instead of different clauses again we're getting different parts that reflect the different subject areas. There's been a lot of language rewrite to make things simpler. Um, 3717 allowable encroachments. We get questions about that at the office almost weekly on allowable encroachments so that was one of the first parts to get a clarification of rewrite. Uh, it's now 3727. And we've separated out um, garage top dwellings into its own part, smoke alarms and evacuation lights. It's, it's, a, it's a much more logical set, uh, set out of um, structure. We've also made changes to the method of measurement. So the very first part up in 3.7, which talks about how you measure your distances for the purposes of determining if you need a, to provide fire protection to an external wall. The clarification we've made is that we've said that that includes, that, uh, sorry, 
let me start again. The clarification is that when you're measuring from an external wall, it excludes an eaves overhang. We found that people were measuring from the eaves that might overhang a separating wall, or sorry, an external wall, which required uh, protection. And we've included this diagram here to illustrate the point that actually take the measurement from the wall. And you see in this diagram that there is no eave coming out over the wall of the taller class one dwelling coming out over the adjacent dwelling. That's because it's not allowed under the NCC deemed to satisfy provisions. Um, because it's taken from the external wall in terms of the measurement and you go to allowable encroachments, 3717, now 3727, you can't have an eave inside that encroached area within that 900 of the adjacent building. So we've included diagrams like this and re and clarified um, method of measurement to make that clear. Another change to note for separating walls is that now you can use a 90 mil brick wall for your separating wall. It's always been there that you can have your FRL 606060 or a 90 mil masonry wall for an external wall. All we've done is pick that up and put that into separating walls because it didn't sit there previously. There's some, ex there's some new explanatory information there and new diagrams like this one to cover circumstances when the 10A is not between the boundary and the class one. So we're very familiar with parts like this one, with diagrams like this one, which comes out of figure 3714. That's now figure 3724 in the restructured uh, part 37. We're all familiar with this, where we've got our 10A between the class one and the boundary, and for that reason, it's either has to be more than 900 millimetres or provided with fire protection, as you see there, a wall of an FRL. However, it is possible for fire to spread around corners. How many people talk about the fire just travelling in one direction for volume two? And in volume one, it can go in all directions. Yeah, I'm seeing some nods there. So because fire can travel around corners, there's a series of new diagrams in three, seven, figure 3724, which take into account situations where the class 10 is not between the boundary and the class one. And of course, there's similar diagrams for where there's two class ones on the same boundary. Where we have less than 900 millimetres, protection has to be provided. If you've got two options, you can protect the wall of the 10A, as shown there, that could be your carport or your garage, or you can provide the protection between the house and the 10A, because it's always been the case that the National Construction Code, the BCA, doesn't mind about the 10A going up in flames. It's about stopping the spread of fire from one class one building to another class one building. It's always been the case. And here are a stack of new figures, new scenarios inside figures 3724. Separating walls. So there's another change in separating walls and that's about cantilevered separating walls. And this one's a bit of a clarification because a lot of walls have been showing up on building sites like this as developers get more and more bedrooms into attached class one dwellings and also have to maintain their driveway turning circles and things like that. So we're getting a lot of cantilevered, cantilevered separating walls. And the question that came up was, does a cantilevered separating wall, as shown in that diagram there, does that commence at the footings or ground slab as required by the NCC. And this is another one where some people say, yes, it does, and other people say, no, it doesn't. It wasn't clear, so we've actually gone and written some new deem to satisfy provisions, which cover what to do when you have a separating wall, which cantilevers, as shown in this diagram. And as indicated there, there's a horizontal projection either side of that separating wall, which requires protection to the, to the underside of the floor. And that goes for 1.8 metres either side. So here's a photo taken from a, a building site, and there's a building site here in Queensland. And you can see how um, you'd have, so I'm gonna just use our, our laser pointer here. So we've got the, can, the separating wall which cantilevers. I'm assured there's plenty of reinforcement in that wall. <laughs> I got scared when I saw this photo, I thought far out. What was the bricklayer thinking? But I'm told there's a lot of backspan and a lot of reinforcement in that masonry wall right there. But um, you could have a fire break out of this one, and of course this doesn't have to be masonry here. A fire can break out of that wall, that dwelling, and move across. The flux is certainly sufficient 
would certainly be sufficient to cause a fire to start in the neighbouring dwelling and then up through the wall. So what to, do with this, what to do in this scenario? The new provisions require fire protection to that area for 1.8 metres. Now that can be a 60 minute incipient spread ceiling, it could be an FRL of 30, 30, 30, or it can be the fire protective covering as defined. Now, of course, these are the existing requirements for a separating floor. All we've done is pick those out and applied them to the scenario where we're providing protection to the underside of a cantilevered, on, the, on both sides of a cantilevered separating wall. So another new part this year is attachment of decks and balconies. I love this photo, the dog's saying, where'd my stairs go? The um, attachment of decks and balconies, because we don't want this to happen. And many would be aware, and I, I don't want to make light of this, because there has been a lot of uh, situations where the deck has become detached, and there has been serious consequences of that. And previously, the NCC has had nothing to do with how you put a whaling plate on a wall so as to provide support to a deck which is attached to a house. So either you do the 1684.2 approach and put a, a bunch of um, posts right next to the wall to take the load, or you would have a whaling plate but have that specifically engineered for that scenario under AS 1170. So those are existing ways of, of getting a deck next to a building. But for NCC 2019, we've included another way, which is found in part 3106, attachment of decks and balconies. And what we're doing is setting out when you can use a whaling plate in order to attach a deck or balcony to a wall. Now, there's some limitations about when you can use this part, as is with the case with many reference standards or any part, many parts of the NCC. You can only apply this new part if your deck is less than or equal to three metres above the footing. And there's also some limitations for the wall. Now, important to note is that your wall has to be a framed wall, timber or steel, it doesn't matter, it has to be a framed wall, or it has to be a core field wall, as shown in this diagram here. There are no deemed to satisfy provisions in part 3106 for a masonry, unreinforced masonry leaf. So your regular brick veneer wall, you can't use 3106 in order to attach a whaling plate to put, support a deck. Of course, you can still use the existing means that are available to you, an engineered solution or a row of posts, but you won't find anything in 3106 for the masonry wall, but what, for the unreinforced masonry wall. But what you will find are fixing requirements how to fix that whaling plate, you're going to find some flashing requirements to ensure that the wall stays weatherproof. You're going to find bracing requirements for the deck. You're also going to find lots of fantastic diagrams like this one, which is showing how the whaling plate is attached to a, to a core field masonry wall. This brings us to energy efficiency, part 312 of volume two. There's been some amendments for energy efficiency, not as substantial as volume one, but there are some. And the first thing to note when we come to energy efficiency for volume two is that it also gets a transition period. It was identified that, um, that energy efficiency generally uh, it might have been a bit too complex to separate it out. So it's blanket rule for energy efficiency. You all get, all the provisions get a transition period. And it's like the volume one one. You can use NCC 2019 Parts 2.6, where the performance requirements are kept, or Part 312, or you can use the current provisions in NCC 2016. Like with Volume 1, you can't mix and match. That, that, that transition runs out on the adoption date of the next, oh, sorry, from 1st May 2020, so that's one year from the adoption date. And what's different? Well, a few things. One to look at is 31201. We've introduced separate heating and cooling loads for houses assessed using house energy rating software. What's this mean? Well, in short, when you get your star rating for a house, that star rating is calculated from a benchmark, which is, takes your heating loads for a year, takes your cooling loads for a year, combines those, and then measures that against the benchmark in order to determine your star rating. You still have to do that, but what this since this alteration here does is it means that you need to take that heating load and compare that heating load with a parameter set out 
and also take your cooling load and separately, calc uh, separately compare that also against a parameter. These parameters are set out in a brand new reference document found on our website freely for, for free download. But you have to do your star rating and your certificate will tell you your heating loads and cooling loads. You've just got to make sure that those separate loads are less than the parameters set out in the new reference document. It's worth noting that J0.2 in volume one, which applies to class two solar units and class four parts of a building, which when you use the star rating method, it also requires separate heating and cooling loads, just as I've described. There's also been changes in building ceiling, including this change here. What this change has done is means that when you've got a class one dwelling and the class 10A carport, or sorry, class 10A garage attached to that, and that garage is not inside the conditioned space, it usually isn't, then you need to put your weather seal on the, on the, on the door that leads from the house into the garage in climate zones four, five, six, seven, and eight. And like I mentioned earlier, there's a new verification method that you could use, the blower door testing method, to check that you're building ceiling. There's been a number of other changes through 3.12.3 uh, to do with building ceiling. A lot of it is um, explanatory information because we noted that it's just information being placed in the code to help you um, achieve building ceiling. We're up to the common schedules now. So we've worked through volume one, we've worked through volume two. The common schedules are found at the back of each volume of the NCC. And the common schedules contain the defined terms for reference documents and other things that are found in all volumes of the NCC. Now, a lot of these defined terms we've, measured, we've mentioned already, such as battery system, occupiable outdoor area. These are new defined terms which are associated with changes that have gone in for NCC 2019. However, there is one definition that's changed of its own accord, and that's the defined term for atrium. Under 2016, a space became an atrium for the purposes of the NCC if it was wholly or substantially enclosed. It's a space which is wholly or substantially enclosed, uh, connecting two or more stories, et cetera. That's an atrium for the purposes of the NCC. This is a photo of an atrium at 1 Bly Street in Sydney, a very interesting building. And this atrium goes through the middle of the building and it's roofed, so it's wholly enclosed and therefore it's an atrium for the purposes of the NCC. But hypothetically, let's say that roof covered 75% of the atrium. Is it substantially enclosed? Probably. What if it covered 50%? Is it substantially enclosed? 25%? Is it substantially enclosed? So it's hard to measure. So what we did is we made a change there to indicate that you need to be greater than 50%. We've put a number on substantially. So when your floor or roof covers 50% or more, of the area of the space measured in plan, then the area, that space, is an atrium for the purposes of the NCC. We've also clarified how that's measured because it was a little bit clear, unclear in the previous defined term. Next to talk about is the fire safety verification method. It's a brand new comprehensive verification method which covers a lot of fire safety performance requirements found in volume one. And because it covers so many performance requirements, we couldn't plug it in each and every it's part of the, each, each and every section of the NCC which had those performance requirements. Instead, we moved it to the back in Schedule 7, where it sits in its own schedule. And because it's not your everyday verification method, it's been given a delayed adoption date, 1st of May 2020. So this is found in the pages of NCC 2019 but it's actually not a part of the NCC for the purposes of the NCC until the 1st of May next year. This is to give industry a chance to become familiar with this new verification method. There's a few things to note up front about this new verification method. The verification method stipulates that it needs to be the performance solution that you make from this verification method needs to be prepared by a fire safety engineer, sometimes known as the fire engineer. The VM makes this stipulation. 
The verification method also stipulates that you need to produce a performance-based design brief. This is the brief that comes out from that four-step process where all stakeholders are include, included in the development of the performance solution. How the verification method operates is that it sets out various design fire scenarios and with each design fire scenario, it stipulates what the outcome for that must be. And in all cases, with every design fire scenario that applies, you need to demonstrate equivalence with the deemed to satisfy provisions. These are a few salient points about the fire safety verification method. And as, it's as it is a verification method, it's worth remembering, as always, a verification method is an option. You don't have to use this from 1st of May 2020. It's there as an option because it may suit your project to use the FSVM. You could always use the deemed to satisfy provisions, or you could use a different performance solution. Now, the fire safety verification method is quite a large and complex verification method. We're not going to go through it in detail today, but there is a specific education program which is being developed for this verification method. So look out, the details are still being finalised, but look out on our website um, for a specific education program for this verification method. Um, it should be available towards the middle of the year. There's also a handbook which goes with this verification method. It's a very large and complex handbook which goes with this complex verification method. And also, because it's going to be enacted on, you know, in May next year, we'll be doing this very seminar series next year. And it's very likely that we're going to be going into more detail in that seminar series on the fire safety verification method. So we're moving into reference documents. That's Schedule 4 in the common schedules to all, all volumes of the NCC. And what this table does here, it shows you, I suppose, the extent of change. Um, almost half the reference documents for each volume have been amended. So when I say amended, that could be a new amendment or a new edition that's been referenced, or it could be a brand new, um, a brand new reference document, such as the FPAA standards that we mentioned that we went over earlier. Now, that's a huge rate of change, and to assist with this, um, amongst, the, amongst the documents that are on your chairs is a list of amendments, specifically for standards, where we've outlined what the changes to each standard are, so that you can use that to make sure that you're using the correct standard when you pick up NCC 2019. And of course, that document is available at that website I mentioned earlier, abcb.gov.au forward slash abcb forward slash seminar. Now soon I'll invite Alison Scotland from Standards Australia to talk about some changes to some reference standards. But before you do that, I want to update you on a change to a note to the AS1530 series and AS4072.1, sorry, AS4072.1. So these are test standards which relate to combustibility, flammability and fire resistance. And for quite a while now, <coughs> excuse me, for quite a while now, each of these test standards has been given a note. And that note has permitted the use of test reports for products under previous editions of the standards. So this is often called the grandfather clause. So the, a new reference standard of AS 1530.1, say, comes along. The grandfather clause allows you to use the existing test reports for products, existing products, if that product had been tested under a previous standard. Amendments carry on and carry on and carry on, but the grandfather clause permits the old provision, the, the, old, the existing products tested some time ago to keep that test certificate. But every time a new edition of a standard is referenced, it's referenced for a reason. It could be for safety, it could be to correct errors. It's referenced for a reason. And so it's been identified that a lot of these grandfathered certificates are actually on quite old standards where and safety and other things have been improved and it's become less appropriate to allow, allow that grandfather clause to remain. So for that reason, an expiry date has been placed on the grandfather clause, and that expiry date is the 1st of May 2022. That's the, the, scheduled, the, the adoption date for the next scheduled edition of the NCC. So until that date, until NCC 2022, you can still use the grandfather clause. The existing products can still be done, used under the previous test certificate. 
However, come 1st May 2022, the existing product has to be retested under the current standard. That note will disappear, which allows the grandfathers in 2022. And after that date, you must use a current test certificate. 